sharing um, with us. It's been probably close to, I don't know, 10 years since you were here. And so, appreciate it. A lot of uh, effort goes into it. He's all over the road. Um, he said he's at home about a week and then he leaves for a week or two. And so, a lot of time put into this. So, thank him if you get a chance. So why don't we start with a prayer, and then uh, we'll have a couple of songs. Father in heaven, we just thank you for this opportunity this evening to be together here. And um, would you just um, be with us and um, teach us in your uh, word and and, um, how we can share and, and carry each other's burdens um, through CAM and that uh, we do have losses and Father we do trust in you um, to carry us through but um, as brothers we want to help each other through these times and so um, just ask for your guidance and direction here tonight And uh, just pray that your will be done. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's turn to uh, number 362. First song. 362. Oh, for a heart to praise my God. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, a heart that sprinkles with the blood so freely shed for thee. A heart resides Okay, uh, next song, um, we'll sing 370, How I Praise Thee, Precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me, thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be, the channels for Jesus Christ. How I praise Now I'm having 
running out of time. How I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love lay hold of me. Now my saved hand lets and fill me, and I like thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Good evening, and thank you for the privilege to come and share with you this evening. My wife Evelyn does travel with me, and yes, we do the public relations work for the mutual aid office, and so, uh, and that also involves uh, training, training our new representatives when we have a new representative in a community. And so uh, we do that as well. And so we've been working with the mutual aid for about the last 14 years. And uh, Evelyn and I both grew up in northern Indiana in the Goshen area, Wakarusa. And about 30 years ago, we fell in love with a little dairy farm up at Hayward, Wisconsin. All five of our children were still living at home. And so we did move to Wisconsin. and. We did milk cows for 10 years. When children got old enough to go their separate ways, our milk cows went down the highway. Mother and I didn't want to do it by ourselves. And so maybe I should, who's all milk cows before? Okay, look at that. All right. Well, we do miss our cows, mostly just twice a month. Okay. <laughs> yes. So uh, we do have five children Four of them are married. We do have 13 grandchildren. And our oldest grandson got married three, four years ago, and he's got a little girl that's two and a half years old, and that really made us feel old when that little girl came along. 
And so uh, we do still live on the edge of the farm there. Our daughter and her husband bought the farm from us five, six years ago, and they turned us out to pasture. And so we build a house in the pasture field. But it's within walking distance for the children. So, uh, so we do still live on the edge of the farm there. And uh, okay, if we could have the lights turned off, I think it's going to make it easier to see the slides here. And pardon? Yes. Uh, if that uh, if that works for your camera. Now, maybe you wanted a little bit more light uh, up front here. All right. If uh, so. Uh, Yes, they're trying to record this this evening. And so, okay, I came across this verse a number of years ago in the Beside the Still Waters devotional booklet. And I appreciated the way the writer had put the words together. And so I quickly made up a slide. In our next slide here, you can see that well, Now what happened? I think we might have a problem. Uh, it's turning on my computer, but it's not, it's not reflecting the uh, slides up here. Uh, okay. Now, let's see what happens. Okay. Well, we'll try it again. So, yes, you can see that we are the other CAM. And people do get us confused with Christian Aid Ministries. But we are a total separate organization. Somebody asked me a couple years ago, Mike, why did you use the same letters that Christian Aid Ministries does? Well, excuse me, we were here about 20 years before Christian Aid Ministries got started. And so I guess we are the original CAM. I guess that's our claim to fame, I guess. And so I like that verse in John chapter 13, verse 35, where Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. And yes, I think if we have that kind of love for each other that God intended for us to have, I think we'll have a desire to want to reach out and help each other, and especially if somebody suffers a loss of some type. And that's what mutual aid is all about, is just plain helping each other. And I think it can be a wonderful testimony to a community when people say, oh yes, that's where the Mennonites live. They help each other. And yes, our neighbors are watching us. Our neighbors watch us a whole lot closer than we're aware of at times. <clears throat> a number of years ago, my older brother had a real nasty chimney fire at his house. And you can see they're getting the hoses stretched out. They don't even have the water turned on yet. And that fire did have a real serious start. In the next picture here, they've got the water turned on and they're knocking it down. But you can see it burning out through the ventilator in the roof there. And yes, it did have a real serious start on things. It was a couple of months after this happened and the people in town were still talking about how when that Mennonite family had their house fire, how the whole church just pitched in to help them out. Well, of course we do that. We've been taught that all our lives, to help each other. Yeah, that's part of our heritage. 
but I think it's part of our identity, if you will. I think it bears out the fact that our neighbors are watching us. Some of you might remember a number of years ago, there was a real bad farm accident at Harrisonburg, Virginia. I'm talking 14, 15 years ago. It was a middle-aged father and his wife and their two daughters and their hired man lost their lives. It was in a Minerpid accident on a dairy farm just outside of Harrisonburg, Virginia. And I remember reading about that on my computer, on my Yahoo News. And I'm convinced that just the fact that it was a Mennonite family, the news reporters just sort of flocked in there and they wrote extra articles about that farm accident. I remember over the next couple days, there were like three or four different articles on the national news headlines about that farm accident. And one of the writers at the end of her article, and I believe it was a lady that wrote this particular article, but at the end of her article she wrote, the Showalter family lived in a quiet Mennonite community where the ladies hang up each other's laundry. And I thought, wow, now isn't that nice? Now maybe you ladies here in Michigan, maybe you hang up each other's laundry. Up in Wisconsin where we live, the ladies don't do that very often. Well. I'll admit that when I read that, that caught me off guard. I remember reading, sitting back in my chair, I read that the second time. I probably read it the third time. I still remember asking myself, why did that lady write that? And you know, I don't know, but I suspect that probably someone had told that lady that the Mennonites help each other, and she didn't know what that meant. But she was a writer, she had to come up with something. And that's what it said right there in the national news. And I think it's all right to smile about that. But you know, I think it bears out the fact that the people of the world know that we plain people have a strong sense of community. Now maybe you're sitting there scratching your head, Mike, what do you mean by that? And hey, it's real simple. We care about each other. And yes, we demonstrate that in different ways. But sometimes it's by helping each other in time of need. But sometimes, sometimes it's just being there for each other in time of sickness or sorrow or death. Yes, when somebody's in the hospital, we go visit them. Well, we used to when they let us. It's been different the last couple of years, yeah. But you know, when there's a death in the family, or death in the community, yes, we go to the viewing. We go to the funeral if possible, just to be there for our friends and our family. And yes, of course, we pray for each other. And you see, it's because of this, this is why we practice mutual aid, because we care about each other. And I don't think the idea of helping each other is a new idea by any means. No, maybe it's even a throwback to the good old days. Many of us still remember hearing our fathers and our grandfathers talk about how those farmers used to take that threshing machine from farm to farm, helping each other. It's been too young. You've been slamming that coffin thresh machine, Fitra. But I've watched it already from a distance, and I know there was more than one reason they helped each other. That was a very labor-intensive operation took a lot of hands to make that operation run smoothly. And then we ought to just ask, who's all helped feed a thresh machine before? Uh, I figured we'd get a half a dozen hands, yes. Well, even though I never helped feed a thresh machine, I still remember when I was a boy and the neighbor's barn burned down and I remember the whole church got together and we built a new barn for the neighbor man. I had a couple chance to help bend a few nails on some of those projects when I was a boy. And yes, they were good days. We got a lot of work done in a day's time, but hey, there was a lot of fun. There was a lot of fellowship. And yes, of course, there was always lots of good food to eat. You bet. Hey, they were good days. And you know, sometimes I think we're missing out on some blessings. We don't do that as much anymore. Well, now, Mike, not as many of us are farmers. So we don't have as many opportunities to get together and help each other as what they used to have. 
Well, that might be, but sometimes I think we have an attitude problem. Yeah, I need a new, uh, I need a new garage, I need a new shed, but sometimes our attitude is, I can afford to do this, I'll just call the pole building company, have them come and build my new shed for me, my new garage. Instead of calling my brothers and say, hey, we're going to frolic at our house Saturday morning. Why don't you all come and help us build our new garage? Yes, I think we're missing out on some blessing. And I hope it's different here at Farwell. I hope you folks look for excuses to get together and have a work day and help each other. I hope you do. A lot of blessings from that. When John F. Kennedy was inaugurated President of the United States, he gave a challenge to the American people. And I think this is the way he said it. He said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And I'd like to just borrow from his idea tonight. And I'd like to challenge us. Let's not ask, well now, Mike, what's this CAM outfit going to do for me, Mike? What am I going to get out of this thing? How is CAM going to improve my bottom line? No, I don't think we ought to ask that. We might be disappointed. But instead, I think we ought to ask, well, Mike, how can I reach out and help my brother that got hit by a tornado? He lives way down in Mississippi or out in Oklahoma. And we live way up here in Michigan. How can we reach out and help him? Because, yes, I think it's when we start reaching out and helping other people that's when God really blesses us in a special way. So I am very thankful that 60 years ago, there were three ministers in northern Indiana. Eli Miller was the bishop at the Town Line Conservative Mennonite Church. Daniel Bontrager was one of the ministers there at the Woodlawn Amish Mennonite Church. Clarence Yoder was the bishop at the Pleasant Grove Conservative Mennonite Church. And these three men saw the need for a sharing plan. They had a vision. And it's no secret, all three of these men came from Amish background. Yeah, they knew how the Amish people reach out and help each other. And so these guys got their heads together. I honestly don't have the details, but perhaps it might have gone a little bit like this. You know, the way we used to do it, we used to pass the hat. And that was a good way. But you know, if we'd pass the hat every time a tornado hits somebody's chicken house down in Kentucky or Tennessee or somebody out there in Kansas or Oklahoma gets hit with a tornado, if we'd pass the hat every time something happened, some Sundays we might have to pass it twice. Maybe three times. Yes. And furthermore, I wouldn't even know what my share is to put into the hat every time the hat comes around. And so I suspect that these men may have been asking the question. Why can't we have an organized system so we can all pitch in and help? And so I know what my share is to put into the hat when the hat comes around. So that was the beginning of the conservative and Amish Mennonite Mutual Aid Society way back in 1958. Well, today we just call it CAM Mutual Aid. But today, today we still pass the hat, but we pass the hat twice a year. We pass the hat in January, and then we pass the hat again in July. And what my share is to put into the hat, my share is based on how God has blessed me. And so I make a list of my house and my furniture. I make a list of my business and my business equipment. I make a list of my farm buildings, my farm machinery, my livestock. And then in January, when the hat comes around, I pay an assessment, but it's based on how God has blessed me. And so what Mike's share is to put into the hat might be different than Henry's share. Or, yeah, somebody else's share. But it's based on how God has blessed me. And the Bible tells us, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. And that's been the motivation, that's been the motto for CAM for many, many years. I like verse 10 of the same chapter. It says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, 
but especially unto them who are of the household of faith. This is a picture of our office building. It's located down at Middlebury, Indiana, right along Route 20 there, just around the curve there, a quarter mile from the big Essen House restaurant. We do have two men that work full time at the office there. Now there is also a part time lady that works a couple days a week. She works from her home sometimes on the computer. CAM is a church based mutual aid uh, established in October of 1958. Today we still serve the conservative Mennonite churches as well as the Amish Mennonite beachy churches fellowship churches, charity churches, other plain churches. We have German Baptist people that are part of CAM. We have Dunkard Brethren churches that are part of CAM. We do have quite a number of New Order Amish churches that are part of CAM. We do also have a number of Old Order Amish people that are part of CAM. No, we're not just exclusively Mennonite, but we are plain people. CAM is a brotherhood sharing plan. Somebody gets hit with a tornado, somebody has a fire, we all pitch in, we help share their loss with them. And no, CAM is not an insurance company. We do operate a little bit like an insurance, in some respects. And yes, this takes the place of a house insurance. But we do not insure any automobiles, we do not insure any trucks, and CAM does not provide any liability insurance to our people. Now we are not suggesting that you don't need liability insurance, but if you need liability insurance for your business, for your property, you do have to buy your liability insurance from an insurance man in town, okay? Now liability is what pays for somebody else's property. If they think it was your fault that their property got damaged, maybe one of your cows gets out on the road and uh, seems it happens after dark. But along comes your neighbor with his shiny four-wheel drive pickup truck and he hits your cow and he might get the, hey, it was your cow, you gotta pick up, pay for my pickup truck. CAM is not gonna pay for the neighbor's pickup truck. We only pay for what our members own, okay? Now I will give opportunity for questions at the end. So if somebody has any further questions about that, about that liability, Mike, do I need liability insurance? Well, you know, that is a very personal question. Now, Mike's not quite as bashful as he was a number of years ago. And I'm gonna suggest if you have any livestock on your farm, you should give some serious consideration to having some liability insurance. And I didn't even ask Steve, does anybody have any large chicken houses? No, okay. Uh, anybody have a hog house and they feed hogs on contract? Nope, okay, well, uh, the reason I ask those questions, quite often they don't own the animals, but the fine print on that contract says that if something happens and those animals die, that farmer might have to pay the chicken company for their dead chickens. And so that would be a liability situation, okay? Yeah, we got, an off we got a letter from, I think it was from Ohio, insurance company in Ohio a number of years ago. One of our families had $28,000 of dead chickens. And who's your insurance company? Well, we're with CAM. So CAM got a letter. You owe us $28,000 for those dead chickens. Well, I'm sorry, we don't give any liability coverage to our members. So no, CAM did not pay for those dead chickens. That would be a liability situation, okay? I'm gonna keep moving here, but we do provide a ministry, a service opportunity to fulfill the law of Christ by bearing one another's burdens. And yes, we do provide assistance to our members for property losses that result from storm, fire, storm, theft, etc. We offer financial as well as physical, moral support. We do have a board of directors that's made up of nine men. I'm not gonna say much tonight about accountability, but yes, this is our accountability, if you will. These men meet three times a year. They keep an eye on our checkbook balance. They keep an eye on the number of claims that come in. And they make many, many decisions concerning the operation of CAM. Now three of those men do serve on our executive committee. And our executive committee meets every month. And they make telephone calls in between those three men. 
they take a look at some of the claims that come in, sort of unusual or unique, sort of outside the box, so to speak. And so uh, they discuss those situations. We don't just have one guy sitting behind a desk that makes all the decisions, okay? He bounces it off the other two men. If it's really a tough one, they might decide, hey, the board of directors is going to meet the end of the next month. We're just going to wait and let the nine-man board of directors take a look at this situation and decide what we're going to do with this, okay? And so sometimes that happens. And uh, we do have real close to 300 representatives. We don't always have one in every church. We try to have at least one representative in every community where we have members. And so Steve has been a representative for 10, 12 years and, uh, or longer. I'm not exactly sure. But uh, once a year, we do have a meeting down in the Goshen area. We invite all of our representatives to come to that meeting. It's our representatives that elect the men that serve on the board of directors. They do serve a three-year term on the board of directors. And so that's the purpose of that nominating committee, just to draw up a slate of names for the election process. But we do have four people on staff. Three of them work there at the office, plus myself. We do work very closely with many different banks. And yes, whenever a bank gives somebody a loan to build a house, to buy a property, to, build a, to buy a business, or to buy some equipment or machinery, the bank is always interested in having their risk covered. It is a very common occurrence at our office that a banker will call up and they want proof of insurance on one of our families. And even though CIM is not an insurance company, most of the banks are happy to accept that piece of paper that we send the bank. And we promise the bank that if anything happens to your house, the bank will get their money, okay? That piece of paper is what the banks call an insurance binder. And yes, it is a federal law. If that banker gives somebody a loan, he must have that piece of paper in your file because the government inspectors come around and check up on these banks. And that banker is going to be in hot water if he does not have that piece of paper in your file. And so, uh, okay, we do have real close to 13,500 families uh, in 40 different states. Now, the reason we don't know exactly how many families we have because we have more accounts than that. But some of our families, maybe, maybe they might own a house down in Florida. Okay, a winter home. So they might have more than one account number. They might have two account numbers, okay? And so uh, that's why we don't know exactly how many families we do have. But property valuation runs on the north side of five and a half billion dollars. Henry, I'm not in the window business. I'm not used to working with those kinds of numbers, okay? I wasn't sure I knew how much that is. Uh, I'm not even sure our congressmen know how much that is. I had to pull out a piece of paper and a pencil. I had to start writing down zeros. You see, that would be, that would be $5,500 million worth of property that our members have listed with CAM. And yes, hey, we're not talking about the value of the farmland, okay, Eli? And we're not talking about the, we're just talking about our house and our barn and our business and our equipment, machinery. God has blessed our plain people very richly. I don't say that lightly. And so we have a great deal to be thankful for. I have a friend that says it this way, life is not fair, or we all would have been born down in Haiti. Huh? Yeah. We have a great deal to be thankful for, don't we? Yes, we do. God has really blessed us. Okay, our assessments are based on the number of claims that come in. We do add on a tiny bit for administrative expenses. And we are trying to slowly build up our reserve fund. Now, about 15 years ago, we had a real bad tornado went across southern Indiana. Davis County, I'm sure you've heard of Davis County before. And Davis County was just about wiped off the map by those tornadoes. And we have a lot of families there in Davis County that are part of CAM. And that was like $10 million worth of damage. This was 15 years ago. We had $10 million worth of damage there from Davis County tornado. And our reserve fund, our kitty, only had about $2.5 million in it at that time. 
and uh, our board of directors made a tough decision. They said, we're going to mail out letters to all of our families and ask everybody to make an extra payment. Yeah, I still remember bringing that envelope in from my mailbox. It was not a good time of the year, two weeks before Christmas. That's not a good time of year to get a big invoice that you weren't expecting. That one just sort of hit you smack in the face. My wife and I had a little conversation about that letter. We had to go to the bank and borrow the money to pay that. Yeah, but you know, I got off cheap. I would much rather make an extra payment than have a tornado hit my farm, huh? Yep, I would much rather make an extra payment than have our house get hit by a tornado. So it is a matter of perspective, isn't it? And you know the Bible says it's more blessed to give than it is to have to receive. And I think that's what the Bible means. And so, uh, okay, we do send out invoices uh, twice a year, January and July. But uh, even though our assessments are based on the number of claims that come in, the assessments don't change every six months. Okay, in fact, our rates, our rates haven't changed for like 11 years. Okay, we've had the same rates. Okay, but the reason the assessments don't change is because we are slowly trying to rebuild our reserve fund. Okay, so just wanted to explain that little detail. But we are a mutual aid. We're not an insurance company, and our members do understand what that really means is if there would be another huge catastrophe, there is always the possibility we might have to make an extra payment again. But that has only happened twice in the last 64 years. It happened back in 1965 when the Palm Sunday tornado went across northern Indiana. I was only about 12 years old, but I still remember that evening. I was outdoors riding bicycle, and the sky was green. I never saw a green sky like that. That Palm Sunday tornado was about 10 miles, 12 miles from our house. And, uh, but uh, at that time, a whole bunch of our families there, Middlebury, Shipshawana, Goshen area, a lot of our families had their farm buildings wiped out by those Palm Sunday tornadoes. CAM was not very big. CAM was only about six years old, not very big. And so everybody had to make an extra payment that time. And then they went to the bank and made a big loan to pay all the damage. And uh, so, uh, but it's only happened twice. God has really been good to CAM. We do have our enlistments divided into two groups. We have our primary, and this is where we list our house and furniture. And then we also have a commercial enlistment where we list our businesses and our farm building. Now, the reason we have them divided into two groups, we get a discount on our house and furniture. We only pay half price on our house and furniture, but it's only on our primary dwelling, okay? So for those people that do own a winter home down in Florida, for example, they do pay the commercial rate on that house in Florida, okay? So it's only our primary dwelling that we get the discount on. So that's why we call these our primary enlistments. But we list our furniture, kind of, maybe you got a couple tools out in the garage, uh, other outbuildings, you might have a garden tool shed or a chicken house or a chicken coop, garden tractor, lawnmowers, buggies, four-wheelers, bicycles, boat and motor, dirt bikes, RVs, camper trailers, uh, church house, school hall, they get listed on the cheaper rate on the primary side, okay? Now on the commercial side, this is where we list our farm buildings as well as our commercial businesses, all types of businesses, whether it's a sawmill, pallet shop, mini barn shop, bulk food store, restaurant, bakery, all types of commercial businesses get listed on the inventory, whether it's raw lumber or whether it's finished product. Inventory, we just list it as a lump sum figure. We don't have to break it apart, just a lump sum figure. Rental houses, yes. We do cover a lot of rental houses for people. Uh, secondary homes, whether it's in Sarasota, whether it's out in Phoenix, Arizona, or somebody's got a hunting cabin up in the mountains somewhere, we cover those too. Construction equipment, business equipment, machinery, tools, excavating equipment, logging equipment, tool trailers, tool trailers. Yes, we cover tool trailers. Boy, they've been a real heartache. 
last number of years, we've been paying for way too many stolen tool trailers. And uh, Thad, uh, boy, he's just about ready to say, you're going to have to pull them home at night. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but yes, we've been paying for too many stolen tool trailers. Farm equipment, machinery, livestock, hay, grain, feed inventory. We don't cover crop damage out in the field. But once that hay is baled, whether it's small square bale up in the hay mow, or you got big round bales lined up along the fence, you can tell Steve to put them on your list for you. And uh, we'll share the risk with you if something happens to those hay bales. And by the way, what are those, who all feeds beef cows? Who's got round bales at home? Okay, what do those round bales sell for this year? 65, 85 dollars a bale? Yeah, something like that. I was out in Montana, the reason I asked, I was out in Montana about two, three months ago. I've got a friend out, and they didn't get any rain last summer. This is up in northeastern Montana is where my friend lives. And uh, early this spring, one of their local farmers there de decided he was going to retire. And he had a farm sale. <coughs> sold the, sold the uh, beef cows, sold the farm equipment, and then they had the haystack to sell there. Well, now, quite a few of those bales, this was all big round bales, came from last year. But some of them were two years old. Some of them were three years. There were even a few of them on the hay pile there that were four years old. $185 a piece for the whole haystack. They sold $430,000 worth of round bailed off of that haystack. Hey, they did, cows are hungry and cows eat. You got to have something to feed them. And uh, they, yes, it was, that was in Montana. And yeah, that's why it surprised me, Henry, that about three weeks ago, North Dakota started getting rain. And South Dakota, they've had so much rain now that I've heard. Now, I haven't been out there in the last two months, but uh, anyhow, uh, yeah, they can't plant any crops up in North Dakota hardly because of all the rain they've had. Okay, builder's risk. Yes, we do uh, provide builders. We have a lot of carpenters, especially, that are appreciate the builder. They get a lot of dollars worth of material delivered out to a job site. They haven't been paid for that material yet. Maybe you're putting the trusses up on a new building and along comes a windstorm and wipes out your trusses. Now somebody gets to go buy new trusses and we share the loss with you on that. And so uh, one of our families, and this happened about 10 years ago in Virginia, was building two brand new chicken houses. Before they ever started, they told their CAM representative, hey, we're going to build two new chicken houses. We need coverage on them, so write them up for us. And uh, this picture here was taken on a Saturday morning. And a couple hours later, this is what it looked like. The wind got in there and raised up those trusses and slammed them back down again. The wall blew out there along the woods. And uh, there was 240 feet of trusses that were cracked and broken. 240 feet, it made a real mess. And they didn't know what they were gonna do. It's gonna take us weeks to get this all cleaned up. I think there's 15 churches in the Southeast Mennonite Conference there. Now most of those churches are around Harrisonburg, Virginia, but three of them are actually over in West Virginia, okay? But on Sunday morning, it was announced in all 15 of their churches, we need volunteers tomorrow morning at the James and Brenda Helmuth farm. And bring your chainsaws along. Well, the problem is that, yeah, James and Brenda don't live at Harrisonburg. They live back at Monterey. Now, Monterey is only three miles from the West Virginia line. And if you want to drive that 50 miles from Harrisonburg back to Monterey, there's two mountain ranges to drive over. It's 35 miles an hour. Switchbacks, the whole nine yard. Been there, done that. I've got one of those caps at home. And so, uh, and this was in the fall. You can see the leaves on the tree. The farmers were busy filling the silo. They didn't know if anybody was going to show up to help or not. James's brother showed up about seven o'clock on Monday morning and he asked his brother, anybody else going to come? He said, well, I don't know. I did hear a couple guys talking that they might. There were 70 people that showed up to help. Praise the Lord. Yeah. 
there were so many cars and trucks. They have a real long lane, but there were so many cars and trucks going in their lane that morning. The neighbor man and his wife were watching. Now their neighbor man is a retired police captain from Florida. And they were looking out the window and they saw that. And they finally got in their car and they drove over there. What's going on here? Why do you have so many people coming in here this morning? And they said, well, you come here. We'll show you what happened. They took them back in the woods. You can't see these chicken houses from the road. They took them back in the woods and showed them what happened. And the neighbor man asked, well, who are all these people you've got here helping you? Well, they're just friends of ours. They're just volunteers that are here to help. And he said, what do you mean volunteers? Aren't you even going to pay them? Well, yes, we're going to give them lunch in a couple hours. The man couldn't believe his ears. You mean there's still people who are willing to come and help without being paid? He just couldn't, yeah. They went back home and that lady pulled a couple bags of frozen cookies out of her deep freezer and she fixed up a plate of cookies and sent her husband back over there to donate that plate of cookies for the noon meal. And that man had tears running down his face when he handed them that plate of cookies. What a testimony. Did I say our neighbors are watching us? Amen. Our neighbors watch us a whole lot closer than we're aware of at times. What a testimony. Yeah, they took the, took the metal off the top of those trusses. And then they took their chains other than cut them in pieces. And the boys stacked up the lumber along the sides there. And uh, it just took them two hours to clean it all up. They had an early lunch that day. My wife and I had the privilege to stop by there about three weeks after this happened. And the new roof was all done. The ceiling was in there. They were getting ready for baby chicks. They were very thankful for all their mutual aid. They emailed me these pictures so I could share them with you. Okay, assessment rates. Our house and furniture get, gets assessed at a rate of 25 cents per hundred dollars, okay? If you have damage, maybe a hailstorm comes through, damages your roof or something, we do have a $250 deductible. And we share the rest of the loss with you. Now, I do have papers back there in the entranceway there on the table with all these numbers on you. You don't have to try to write these numbers down. And by the way, I think my wife's got some uh, little plastic pan scrapers back there, some spatula. Help yourself to those items uh, back there on the table, ladies. And... Uh, Okay, on the commercial side, the rate there is $5 a thousand, okay? Deductible, if you have damage on the commercial side, our deductible there is 5% of the amount of the claim. Now, we do have a $500 minimum on that, so we don't send in claims that are smaller than $500. Upset and collision claims, we do have a 10% deductible on upset and collision claims. And there is a $1,000 minimum on the upset and collision claims. I mentioned logging equipment a couple minutes ago. Maybe they're working on a pretty steep hillside and somebody got a little too shusly with that big machine and he cuts the corner too short, lays that machine right over on the side. And yes, we've got more loggers in our church up in Wisconsin than we do farmers. And so it happens once in a while. That machine lays over and now the might get to call a big wrecker with a big winch on the back to set that machine back up again. And if the operator wasn't quick enough to kill the engine, if that machine's laying there on the side with the engine still running and no oil getting to the oil pump, yes, it only takes a minute or two to spin the bearings. And now somebody gets to overhaul the engine on that thing. And it's going to kill about ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 till it's all said and done. We are going to share the loss with him on that, but we're going to let him pay 10% of the bill on that one. That would be upset and collision, okay? Now that's a poor picture there. It almost looks like a wheel sticking up in the air. Yes, it is a wheel. That's a front end loader, but it did not have a bucket on the front. They had the forklifts on it at the top. They were going to cut down this great big tree, and so they had the boom way up in the air. They had a fork on each side of the tree and were pushing on it. But they forgot to tell the tree to go that way, and the tree decided to go that way. And you can see what happened. Mother said there would be days like this, didn't she? And uh, yes, it happens. Okay, property valuation. Our building should be listed at current replacement costs. Now, this is part of Steve's job is to sit down with you and help you figure out what a realistic replacement cost is on your house or each one of your buildings that you want to put on your list. Uh, 
And yes, that replacement cost does have to reflect a realistic labor figure. And so, uh, whatever, if you would have a total loss on that building, now what would it cost to hire a contractor to come and build another building just like that? Okay, whatever amount you have your house or your building listed for on your, that is the amount that CAM is going to pay, is going to share with you if you have a total loss. Okay, whatever amount you've got it listed for, minus that deductible that we just talked about a couple minutes ago, okay? But most often, it's not a total loss. It's much more frequent that we just have a partial loss on a building. And so for that reason, we do stipulate that a building does have to be listed to at least 80% of replacement cost in order to get full coverage on a partial loss. Now that's a mouthful, and I'm going to try to explain what we're saying here. Perhaps this family lives in a real modest house. They've got their house listed for $100,000. Okay? Now today's world, no. That does not build a very big new house, $100,000. <coughs> But they have a very small amount of, that's what they've got it listed for. So if they would have a total loss on their house, we'll mail them a check for $100,000 minus the $250 deductible, okay? But maybe it wasn't a total loss. Maybe they had a chimney fire and it just burned off those two little bedrooms upstairs, but the roof was burned off. By the time they get it all fixed up, maybe it cost $50,000 to get their house all fixed back up again, okay? But they've got it listed for the full amount. So we'll mail them a check for 50000 so they can get their house fixed back up again. Okay? Minus the 250 bucks. Don't forget the 250 bucks. All right. So, but then we've got the next family says, yes, but Mike, it was 15 years ago we built our new house. And back then it only cost us $80,000 to build our new house. I know today it'd be over hundred. I know it would. But back then it was only 80000 That's all I have mine listed for is 80000 Okay? Now, if they would have a $50,000 loss, that $80,000 is still within our 80% range, okay? And so if they'd have a $50,000 loss, we'll still mail them a check for $50,000 so they can get their house fixed up, minus the $250, okay? But then, then we've got George. Now, do we have anybody here by the name of George tonight? I hope not. We're not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. But George, Mike, it was 25 years ago we built our new house. And back then it only cost us $60,000 to build our house. I know today it'd be double that. I know it would. But back then it was only $60,000. And that's all I have mine listed for is $60,000. Well, now, if George would have a $50,000 loss, now we have a problem. Because that 60000 that 60000 he's got his covered for, that's only three-fourths of our minimum. Huh? And the reason we have this 80% is because of inflation. Okay, you've all heard of that dirty little word, haven't you? Yeah, I think we know what inflation's all about. And so, uh, so George has only got his house at three-fourths of that amount. So now, when George has a $50,000 loss, now we're only going to share three-fourths of his law. We're just going to mail him a check for 37500 minus the 250 bucks. Hey, we're trying to be fair to the people who have their house listed for 200000 or 300000 They're putting their full share into the hat every time we pass the hat. And George, well, yes, his representative did tap him on the shoulders a couple of years ago. And George, now we need to increase the value on your house. And we, no, nah, it's good enough. Leave it where it is. He sort of liked those cheap payments, see? But hey, we don't want any hard feelings. Mike, you mean I've been a member of this outfit all these years? And now when I have a loss, you mean that's all you're going to share with you? With me? Wait a minute. Now, George, whose fault is it that you didn't increase the value on it a couple years ago when your representative reminded you? Yeah, we don't want any hard feelings. So... Any item that you have that's over a thousand dollars, if you want it to be covered, you do have to list those, itemize those items separately. Equipment or whatever. If it's over a thousand dollars, list it separately. And then we write down the word miscellaneous to cover all the small tools, hand tools, impact wrenches, socket sets, 
wrench sets, air nailers, power nailers, and all that. Just write down the word miscellaneous and put down an adequate amount, maybe $15,000, eight or fit ten, whatever, however big your shop is, just put down an adequate amount to cover all the little things. Same way in the house. You don't have to make a list of the blender and the toaster and the electric skillet. No, we don't do that. Just write down the word miscellaneous and just put down twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars to cover all the, to, all the miscellaneous furniture and stuff. Okay? But if you've been married for 30 years, you better put down thirty thousand dollars. Huh? For 40 years, yeah, you better put down 40000 That's sort of the way it works. And so uh, rental equipment, maybe you go lease a piece of equipment once in a while, whether it's a backhoe or maybe one of those big jackhammer air compressors uh, or maybe a scissor lift scaffold or even a forklift, maybe even one of those big telehandlers. And the guy at the equipment rental place, now you're responsible for this machine. Anything happens to it, you have to pay for it. So you better have some coverage. And all you have to do is make one quick telephone call to Steve, and you'll be covered. Okay? And if the guy at the equipment rental place, if he wants proof of insurance on that, we'll send that piece of paper. We'll fax it right directly to the equipment rental place for you, showing that you're covered. Okay? If that's a $60,000 piece of equipment, that will cost 25 bucks to have that machine covered up to a whole month even if you're only going to use it for a week and a half or two weeks. But we, we do have a 30-day minimum. We cover you for a whole 30 days. Now, if it's a $100,000 piece of equipment, it's going to cost a little more than that. But a $60,000 piece of equipment, it's going to cost 25 bucks to have that machine. And we don't plan on those things happening. No, we don't plan on it. Once in a while, it does happen. And that's embarrassing when that happens. I hate when that happens. I even know that guy is standing up there at the end of the trench. And that's not Mike either, in case you thought that looked like Mike. But uh, I do know that guy. And uh, yes. Okay, hail damage. This happened out in Missouri about seven years ago. They had golf balls dropping out of the sky. Some of it was the size of baseballs. I saw a pickup truck, and I think it was only two years old. And all the windows were broke out of that pickup truck. The hood was bashed down, and the roof, it did a real number on that pickup truck. We paid for a number of metal roofs on our families there in that church. And so, uh, and you know what that hail looks like. It's not always round and smooth, sharp, jagged edges. That vinyl siding just didn't stand a chance. So uh, this is actually a different house here. Ooh, I think we know what that is, don't we? Now this happened about nine, ten years, yeah, nine years ago, Macon, Mississippi. This was the J. Hoover farm, J. and Shirlene Hoover. You can see what's left of their house. He had a big implement shed. You can see where his grain bins used to sit. He had just built a brand new farm shop about a year before this happened. Had a big overhead door on the end of it. Then back here he had a roll door where he could back his semi-trailer in. Back across the field, they had six Chicken houses, broiler houses. They were old ones, 40 by 400, I think. But those chicken houses were not hit. We were very thankful for that. But Shirlene was at home. One of her daughters had stopped by for a couple minutes with a couple children. The son-in-law drove up to the house in the pickup truck. He ran inside. There's a tornado coming. You have to leave right now. Just get in the car and drive down the road six or seven miles. They don't have a basement under their house. It's because of the soil type they have there making very few people put basements under their houses. Because that soil, it forgets to rain for about three weeks and that soil dries out and gets big cracks and then it starts raining for two weeks in a row and that stuff swells and the basement walls just get crushed right in. Caved right, and so that's why they don't build basements under their houses. And uh, so yes, they grabbed the children, they got the car, drove down the road, and 10 minutes later, this is what it looked like, 10 minutes later. Nobody got hurt. They had a sign above the fireplace, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. My wife and I had the privilege to stop and visit them about four months after this happened. And they told us all about it. And I'd like to just try to explain something when something like that happens and you lose everything. They had just remodeled their house about two years before this. 
you lose everything, and we're all human, then we, God, where were you? Don't you care? Yes, God cares. And that meant a great deal to them. That sign above the fireplace was still intact. That meant a great deal to them. Now this just happened about six months ago. Paris, Tennessee, Cottage Grove, back in December, Marlon and Orpha Wagler. That was on a Friday evening when this happened. The day before, on Thursday, there was a funeral there at Rutherford. And Orpha's father had passed away and they buried her father on Thursday. She has a sister and her husband live over in Crossville, Tennessee. But they had spent a couple extra days there at Marlon's house. And so her sister and her husband, Steve, were actually sleeping upstairs in the house. And Marlon's brother called about 10.30 and said, Hey, that tornado is on the ground and it's headed right for your place. You need to go to the basement right now. Well, they yelled upstairs to her sister and her husband. And uh, they headed for the basement. And they got down to the basement and her sister said, Well, where's Steve? Well, I guess he didn't come down. And so Marlon runs all the way back upstairs. And Steve had rolled over in bed and went back to sleep again. And so Steve drug him out of bed. Hey, there's a tornado coming. We have to go to the basement right now. Oh, all right. I'll get some clothes on. And uh, they went to, and they were down there less than 10 minutes. And that thing hit. And you can see the roof. They had a uh, carport right here on the end of the house. Now this car here and that car there were parked side by side under the carport. They found the carport. It's out there in the hayfield and the upstairs. This is what the end of the house looks like. You can see the floor joists are still in place and the subflooring. Now that window right there I think was the bathroom window. And all four of the bathroom walls were still in place. They were able to reuse those four bathroom walls. This happened on Friday night. Saturday there was a whole bunch of people there to help clean up on Saturday. And Monday morning they started building a new house right on top of the same subfloor. They built a new house again. And they reused the bathroom walls. My wife and I got there Wednesday afternoon at 4 o'clock. They were just finishing up the metal around the dormers there. And by 5 o'clock, that metal roof was all done. They were expecting a heavy rainstorm that night again. And it did. Uh, they got a heavy rain that night. Just up the road, about four or 500 feet, they had a small rental house. And they just bought this about a year and a half ago. This thing came up for sale, and so they bought it. They had a young couple from their church that was living in the rental house. And that young couple was down in the basement. They were over here in the northwest corner. And the wife said to her husband, I think we ought to go in the south side. I think it's a little safer. Tornadoes. And so they went from the north side. They went over to the south corner there. And ten minutes later dumped that house right down in the exactly where they had been just minutes before. It was a miracle. God had motivated them to get over to the southwest corner. It was a miracle. But yes, it made a mess. It just totaled, totaled that rental house, tore it all apart. Now, out back, they've got two chicken houses. These are layer hens. So he does have egg gathering belts that run full length. These are 500 foot long chicken houses. The metal roof was torn off of this one. They put a whole brand new metal roof on this one. And the other chicken house is a total loss. They had to tear it all down and start over on this one here. But they did rebuild both of them. Okay, if you do have damage of some kind, call Steve. He'll come take a look at your damage. He does have a little form to fill out, and he'll get two other men from the church here to sign that little claim form and email it to the office. Thad will probably write the check tomorrow. The next day, Thad will write the check. And so no depreciation on equipment. Whatever amount you have your equipment machinery listed for, that is the amount the CM will pay if it's a total loss on that equipment. If it's a fire on a forklift or whatever the case might be. But if it's a total loss, whatever amount you had it listed for, that's the amount CAM is going to pay. Logging equipment, yes. A forwarder, well, they call it a packer back. But that thing caught fire out in the woods. This is a fellow from our church. And uh, he bought that machine brand new. And they did have a fire extinguisher. They tried to knock it down, but it was too hot. They couldn't get it. 
And yeah, it toasted that machine. He bought it brand new, but it was eight years old. It was half worn out. They put a lot of hours on those machines. He had it on his list for $100,000. And on the commercial side, we have a 5% deductible. This happened on Monday morning. Saturday, there was a check in the mailbox for $95,000. The following Tuesday, he went and bought a used machine so he'd get back to work again. He was very thankful for the quick turnaround. We do cover trailers. We cover all types of trailers. Tool trailers, utility trailers, camper tra boat trailers, even semi-truck trailers. Uh, it is state law. Whenever you hook a trailer or something behind the truck and you head down the highway, if that trailer would fishtail across the center line and hit an oncoming car, it's the insurance policy of the truck that pays for the damage to that other car. That is state law in all 50 states. Okay, now CAM will pay you for the damage to your trailer or to replace your trailer if it's a total loss. CAM will pay for the trailer. Fire, yes, we need fire. Well, we hope we don't need them, but you know, we should have them. We should have them. Those things are really cheap, much cheaper than building a new house. Huh? Yeah. If you don't have a fire extinguisher in your house, don't go to town and buy one. Buy three of them. Yeah. Buy five of them. Those things are really cheap. And don't go to Walmart and buy one with a plastic head on top. Go to the hardware store and buy one with a metal head on top for a couple bucks more. The ones with the metal head on don't leak the pressure out as quick. And so, uh, yes, it is part of good stewardship. We have a charity fund grant at CAM to help families that have any emergencies. No, they didn't get hit with a fire. They didn't have a tornado. But uh, maybe somebody got hurt on the job and was off of work for a couple months. Or maybe they had a huge medical bill. Our charity fund is a matching grant. And so if your congregation is said, look, this family has an emergency. Why don't we lift an offering to help them? And so if you decide to lift an offering to help that, we'd like to pitch in and help. CAM will match your church's offering up to $3,000. Okay? Yeah. And they don't have to be a member of CAM. They don't even have to be a member of your church. If they've been attending regularly and you decide to lift an offering, we'd like to help. So we'll match your church's offering. Disaster strikes, whether you have a fire or you get hit with a storm. CAM is here to, that used to be a house. That picture was taken down in Davis County, Indiana. I don't think I can imagine what it would feel like to come home. That's all you've got left. So yeah, CAM is a vehicle, makes it possible for us to reach out and help others. Many blessings to be shared. It's, a, it's an attitude, it's a privilege to help others. Many blessings to be shared from working together as a brotherhood. We do have a website, cammutualaid.com. I know that many of you are part of us here. Thank you for being part of us. Okay, if we could have the lights turned on, please. I said I'd give opportunity for questions. Maybe somebody has a question about something. Wake up, Harvey. Oh, he's awake. All right, he's awake. So, in the last two years, with the cost of lumber and things going up, we should be helping our value for our I would think so. Even 150000 doesn't go very far today to build a new house. Yep. Yep, two by fours are eight, nine dollars a piece, and OSB board, 40, 50 bucks a sheet. Yeah, frightful, frightful. Yeah. Yep, when you get home, pull that piece of paper out of your file count. How much do we have our house listed for, anyhow? Give Steve a call, and yeah. Anyone else?
Hey, thank you very much for the privilege to come and share. And uh, who's done a good job. well? We'll be around here a couple minutes. I mean, yes, Steve. Oh, uh, yes. There, there's a difference uh, whether you cover it or not. Yes. Four wheelers and dirt bikes, snowmobiles, buggies, horse drawn equipment. Those items are not covered while they're in use. So that four wheeler is covered when it's in the shop, in the shed. But if somebody's out chasing a cow in the pasture field and they run into a tree with that, that four-wheeler is not covered while it's in use. Like tractors. tractors and farm equipment are covered. That's upset and collision. But dirt bikes, snowmobiles, boat and motor, four-wheelers, horse-drawn equipment, buggies, those are not covered while they're in use. Pontoons and boats. Now they would be covered on the road, but not when they hit the water. Yeah. Hey, I think they've got some finger foods out there. Uh, who's going to close them in? Henry, going to. All right, thank you. Well, appreciate everybody that uh, showed up, and you did a real good, thorough. Uh, I myself, I've been with Cam for a long time, but I understand it a lot more than I had. I just paid the bill when I got it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we have finger foods out there, and so if we can just 